in today's true crime and tutorial tuesday i'm talking about stephen lawrence whilst doing my makeup keep on watching to hear about his murder and to see me create this makeup look Stephen Lawrence was born in Greenwich District Hospital on the 13th of September 1974 to Jamaican parents who had emigrated to the UK in the 1960s. His father is Neville Lawrence, who was then a carpenter, and his mother is Doreen, who was then a special needs teacher. And he was brought up in Plumstead, South East London, and he was the eldest of three children. The other has been Stuart, that was born in 1976 and Georgina, who was born in 1982. During his teenage years, Stephen excelled in running, competing for the local Cambridge Harriers Athletics Club, and appeared as an extra in Denzel Washington's film for Queen and Country. He was studying for his A-levels and wanted to be an architect when he was older. Fast forward to Thursday the 22nd of April 1993, when he was only 18 years old. After spending the day at school, he visited the shops in Lewisham, then travelled by bus to an uncle's house in Grave Park. He was joined there by his friend Dwayne Brooks, and they played video games until they left at about 10pm. After realising that the 286 bus on which they were travelling would get them home late, they decided to change for either the bus route 161 or bus route 122 on Walhall Road. They arrived at the bus stop on Wellhead Road at 10.25pm. Stephen walked along Wellhall Road to a junction of Dixon Road to see if he could see a bus coming and then went back towards the bus stop. Dwayne was still on Wellhall Road between Dixon Road and the roundabout with Rochester Way and Weston Avenue and Dwayne saw a group of five or six white used crossing Rochester Way on the opposite side of the street near the area of the zebra crossing and moving towards them and at or just after 10.38pm he called out to ask whether Stephen saw them come in. The attackers forced Stephen down to the ground and then stabbed him to a depth of about five inches on both sides of the front of his body in the right collarbone and left shoulder. Both wounds severed axillary arteries before penetrating a lung. Stephen lost all feeling in his right arm and his breathing was constricted while he was losing blood from four major blood vessels. Dwayne began running and shouted for Stephen to run to escape with him while the attackers disappeared down Dixon Road. Dwayne and Stephen ran in the direction of Shooter's Hill. Stephen collapsed after running 130 yards and he bled to death soon afterwards. The pathologist recorded that Stephen managing to run this distance with a partially collapsed lung was a testimony to his physical fitness and Dwayne ran to call an ambulance while an off-duty police officer stopped his car and covered Stephen with a blanket. Stephen was taken to Brook General Hospital by 11.05pm, but he was already dead. On 23rd of April, the day after the murder, a letter giving the names of the suspects is left in a telephone box and police surveillance begins on their homes four days later. On the 4th of May, Stephen's family hold a press conference to complain that not enough is being done to catch his killers. They meet Nelson Mandela two days later and from the 7th of May to the 23rd of June, suspects are arrested and two of them are charged. Police arrest brothers Neil and Jamie Acourt, David Norris, Gary Dobson and Luke Knight and search their homes. Neil Acourt and Luke Knight are identified by Dwayne Brooks at ID Parades as part of the gang responsible and the pair are charged with murder. They denied the charges and on the 29th of July the charges are dropped. The CPS drops the prosecution as it says that the ID evidence from Dwayne Brooks is unreliable. And on the 22nd of December the inquest is halted. The Southwark coroner, Sir Montague Levine, halts an inquest into Stephen's death after the family's barrister, Michael Mansfield QC, says there is dramatic new evidence. In April 1994, CPS refuses to prosecute. There is insufficient evidence to bring charges based on the new evidence, which was believed to be the identification of further suspects, is what the CPS says. 
In September, a private prosecution is launched and Stephen's parents, Doreen and Neville Lawrence, launch a private prosecution against Gary Dobson, Luke Knight and Neil Acor. All three of them deny the charges. A private prosecution is the same as a standard criminal trial but it's not brought by the CPS. And in December, covert video shot over several days in Dobson's flat captures him and Norris using strong racist and violent language and Neil Acor and Luke Knight are also caught on camera using violent and racist language. From the 18th to the 25th of April 1996, the private prosecution fails. The murder trial begins against Neil Acor, Luke Knight and Gary Dobson at the Old Bailey, but the case collapses when Mr Justice Curtis rules that the identification evidence from Brooks is inadmissible and all three of them are acquitted. On the 13th of February 1997, the inquest resumes and the five suspects refuse to answer questions. A verdict of unlawful killing in a completely unprovoked racist attack by five youths is delivered by Sir Montague. And on the 14th of February, the Daily Mail newspaper uses its front page to name the five men it says killed Stephen Lawrence and it invites them to sue if they are wrong. In March, the Kent Constabulary launches its probe into police conduct, which nine months later highlights significant weakness, omissions and lost opportunities, but it says there's no evidence of a racist conduct. In July, the Home Secretary, Jack Straw, says there will be a judicial inquiry into the killing and subsequent investigation to identify lessons for police in dealing with racially motivated crimes. It will be chaired by Sir William Macpherson, a retired High Court judge. In March 1998, the five suspects are told to give evidence or face prosecution. In June, they appear and they are pelted with bottles by protesters as they leave after being accused of being evasive. In July, police apologise and the Lawrence family call on the Met Police Commissioner, Sir Paul Codden, to resign. He apologises to them when he appears in October, admitting there had been failures. In February 1999, the McPherson report is published. It accuses the Metropolitan Police of institutional racism and makes 70 recommendations many aimed at improving police attitudes to racism. It also includes some proposals for changes in the law, including strengthening the Race Relations Act to try and clamp down on discrimination. In September 2002, David Norris and former suspect Neil A. Court are jailed for 18 months for a racist attack on an off-duty police officer in Eltham in 2001. Norris, a passenger in a car driven by a car, threw a drink and shouted racist abuse at the black officer. In May 2004, the CPS finally announces there is insufficient evidence to prosecute anyone for Stephen's murder following a review. In April 2005, Double Jeopardy is scrapped. This means that the government has dropped the legal principle which prevents suspects from being tried twice for the same crime. In July 2006, a BBC documentary investigating the case raises fresh questions about the prime suspects, prompting the Metropolitan Police to review their evidence. In October 2007, the Independent Police Complaint Commission says it has found no evidence of wrongdoing by an officer as alleged in part of the documentary. In November 2007, forensics are reviewed and police confirm that they are investigating new forensic evidence in the case after a police review staffed by 32 police officers was launched the previous summer. It examined evidence gathered at the time looking at opportunities to use new technology to find leads. In February 2008, a memorial opens. Doreen Lawrence opens a £10 million architecture centre in honour of her son and only two weeks later, vandals smash its windows in a suspected racist attack, which is so horrible that you know, something that's a memorial, people found the need to, you know, go and, you know, smash it up. Because it's just so disrespectful and I just really feel for his parents and for his family. In February 2009, 10 years on from the Macpherson inquiry, a report from a member of its panel, Dr Richard Stone, says the police have made significant process in reforming but charges of racism remain. Justice Secretary Jack Straw says the Met is no longer institutionally racist but Stephen's mother says the police still fail black Britons. 
In July 2010, Gary Dobson starts a five-year jail term for supplying a Class B drug after being caught during a sting by the Serious Organised Crime Agency. In May 2011, Gary Dobson and David Norris are to face trial over the murder of Stephen Lawrence following a review of forensic evidence. The court appeal decides there is enough new and substantial evidence to allow Dobson's acquittal to be quashed. The pair had been charged the previous September. In November, the trial begins. The trial of Dobson and Norris begins at the Old Bailey. The jury hears that Stephen's DNA was found on the defendant's clothes. In January 2012, Dobson and Norris are both found guilty of murder at the end of a six-week trial into the death of Stephen Lawrence. During the trial, the court hears that microscopic evidence found on clothing belonging to the accused links them to the murder. The jury takes two and a half days to reach its decision. Both men receive life sentences. Dobson is jailed for a minimum of 15 years and two months and Norris for 14 years and three months. In June 2013, a former police officer spied on the Lawrence family and the Prime Minister calls for an immediate investigation into reports the police wanted to smear Stephen Lawrence's family. The Guardian claims former police officer Peter Francis went undercover to infiltrate the family's campaign for justice in 1993 and Mr Francis tells the paper and Channel 4's dispatches programme that he was looking for disinformation to use against those criticising the police. In March 2014, a new public inquiry is launched on a dramatic day of developments. A review into the original murder investigation by barrister Mark Ellison finds that an undercover Met Police officer worked within the Lawrence family camp while an inquiry into the handling of the murder was underway. It also finds that there are reasonable grounds to suspect at least one detective on the team was corrupt. This leads Home Secretary Theresa May to announce a new public inquiry into the undercover policing and a separate report into Operation Herney, an investigation launched by the Mayor into the allegations made by the former undercover officer Peter Francis finds no evidence to back claims he was tasked to smear the Lawrence family, but it does find failings regarding allegations about undercover officers indulging in inappropriate sexual relationships. In March 2015, an inquiry into undercover policing is launched and the public inquiry into the abuse of undercover techniques by police officers is launched whilst its scope is wide. It includes, for example, the use of dead children's names in fake identities, one of its main focus points in the infiltration of the Lawrence Campaign for Justice. Over the next three years, the inquiry suffers setbacks due to the burgeoning list of participants and issues around revealing the identities of former undercover police officers. In October, the National Crimes Agency, NCA, confirms it has been investigating alleged police corruption during 1993 murder inquiry for months. The new investigation is prompted by the findings of the 2014 Ellison Review. Any findings are to be reported back to the police watchdog and could result in criminal or misconduct proceedings. In March 2016, the police watchdog finds ex-Met Police Commander Richard Walton would have been able to answer a case for misconduct after meeting an undercover police officer during the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. Mr Walton met the officer in 1998, allegedly obtaining information about the Lawrence family and their supporters. The watchdog said he would have faced a disciplinary hearing but had retired. Lawyers for Neville Lawrence unsuccessfully urged the force to halt Mr Walton's retirement earlier that year. Mr Walton said that the Met had rejected the watchdog's findings and did not plan to bring misconduct proceedings. In September, Scotland Yard announced it has received significant information after a BBC crime watch reconstruction. Detectives attempt to identify a woman whose DNA was on a handbag strap found close to the murder scene and a separate possible witness. In April 2018, the Met says the investigation into Stephen's murder is unlikely to progress without new information. Doreen Lawson tells the Daily Mail she believes that detectives have run out of the lines of inquiry and calls on them to be honest about the likelihood that anyone else would be convicted over his murder. Neville Lawrence tells the BBC News that he would accept the inquiry being scaled back but believed it should not be completely closed and Dr Lawrence adds he remains hopeful that with the police publicity around the 25th anniversary of his son's death and the BBC documentary, Stephen, the murder that changed the nation, someone would come forward.
In August 2020, the Metropolitan Police declared the investigation into Stephen's death inactive. They said all identified lines of inquiry have been completed, which means that no one else can be taken to trial and held responsible for Stephen's death, unless the case is later reopened. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Cressida Dick, said that she was sad that the Met had been unable to secure any further convictions for Stephen, his family and friends. She added the investigation has now moved to an inactive phase, but I have given Stephen's family the assurance that we will continue to deal with any new information that comes to light. So that's everything for this case. I hope you guys have all enjoyed the video and I'll see you all in the next one.